We'll go ahead and get started then. We'll see if some others jump in. We got a good group of folks here, and I think that's the first interesting group. Um, glad, glad to see uh, Miss Gonzalez down there in the right corner of Janice's daughter. Um, so thanks for jumping on. Uh, and uh, um, want to welcome, of course, two of my favorite people, my favorite coworkers to uh, to uh, uh, work with is Jason Baldus and Garrett Vogaser. Um, Known them really for the last three years, um, and uh, just you know, profound admiration for the work that they do um, with our with with our nation's tribes and and indigenous communities, um, and 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 more so, just really um, solid people um, that I that I found to be really great conversation partners and colleagues. And Jason came down and had dinner with my wife and I. I don't know, maybe it felt like it was a couple decades ago. Now with the pandemic, but it was about a year and a half ago when he was down here doing a. It was a Buffalo summit that he'd kind of come down and, and been a part of and, and speaking with some of the New Mexico Pueblos and tribes um, with down here. And, and then Garrett uh, Vogaster is up in Colorado. So I'll let them both introduce themselves, talk a little bit more about themselves. But um, it's just really cool for me to have an opportunity as a pastor at First Presbyterian Church um, with joining with, with Pastor Harry um, to, you know, kind of see these two worlds come together um, with conservation and an opportunity to talk about culture and spirituality and issues of race and kind of dig into that and have a little bit more of an in-depth conversation in a really great way with lots of different community people that I that I get to work with in different ways, shapes, and forms on my weekends and during my week. So um, I want to hand things over to Garrett and Jason, if you all wouldn't mind introducing yourselves, talking a little bit about where you're from, uh, who you are, and then I'll, you know, I'll kind of get us going with a couple different questions and then we'll kind of open things up to the broader group. Hello everyone, my name is Garrett Bogesser. I work for the National Wildlife Federation along with Andrew and Jason. I direct our tribal partnerships program. Um, I've been with National Wildlife Federation for about 17 years. Uh, I'm a native Coloradoan, that's where I'm at now. And uh, I just appreciate the opportunity to, to share time with you and tell you a little bit about our work and our partnerships with tribes. Um, and I just wanna thank you and your church and all the folks that uh, for welcoming us and then also for your contribution. That's much appreciated. Jason's got a lot of long list of things he wants to do with Buffalo. <laughs> your, your investment in that is, is greatly appreciated. So thanks for having us. Yeah, good afternoon, uh, everybody. In our language, we say Zond Dive. Good, good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Andrew. Very good to be here with you. and. Uh, and with the congregation, and thanks, Garrett. Um, very uh, pleased to work in this capacity of, uh, you know, as a tribal buffalo program manager for National Wildlife Federation, and for the effort of NWF to be inclusive and to empower and work with tribes. Uh, and and my particular tribe, I'm a member of the Eastern Shoshone tribe here on the Wind River reservation in Wyoming and uh, I, I work to restore bison or buffalo back here to the landscape along with um, other tribes across the country and restoring that relationship understanding that history and contemporarily why that is so important is uh, a, a very big deal for me and to be uh, able to do this work is uh, extremely I'm extremely grateful for it and, and thankful. Um, just glad to be here with you all and to be able to answer any questions and uh, talk about Buffalo. I, I, there's not a day that goes by that I don't talk about Buffalo. So <laughs> I, I love that. And uh, thank you very much for your contribution. Very much appreciated. So we'll, we'll get things started. Uh, Jason, we'll kind of start with you. Um, you know, Jason, Jason was gracious enough to come to uh, one of our, uh, he phoned in back when, when we could still meet in person uh, to our, one of our environmental ethics courses. And we talked a little bit about, um, uh, listened to him a little bit about kind of bison and culture. And so Jason, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, what does bison mean to you and to your culture? Um, what, is it, what do you see it kind of meaning to kind of some of the broader tribal cultures? And, you know, obviously this class is one of the challenges and opportunities of this class is to give um, the, the church an opportunity to kind of look at racial systems and structures. And, you know, in, in our previous class, we talked about, um, you know, kind of the, 
the just destruction of kind of bison and other wildlife throughout the American West and kind of what that did, um, you know, both not only in terms of the ecosystems and the wildlife, but what that did in terms of people and culture. And so I'm just kind of hoping you can kick us off with a little bit of that discussion of, of, of you know, um, your work around bison, what does it mean to you in your culture? And then what have you seen kind of been the historical challenges with the bison population being decimated and what that has done to indigenous communities? Wow, Andrew, uh, <laughs> there's, a, there's a whole lot of information I can try to squeeze into a couple minutes. I, um, it, for, for me, uh, as a Shoshone tribal member, uh, you know, the Eastern Shoshone people, we speak the Uto Aztecan dialect, and that comes from the South. Uh, Aztec is, is the origin of, of that language. We're one of the, the, the numic speaking branch of that language. And then we distinguished ourselves by the foods we ate. And so over the mountain in Idaho, we have the salmon eaters. Uh, there was a band of Shoshones that lived in the mountains. We called them the sheep eaters. The Eastern band of Shoshones, we called ourselves the buffalo eaters, Wichandika in our language. And so the buffalo eaters uh, is, wasn't our only food source, but it was a very primary food source for uh, for our people. Our our communities, the wealth and the health of our communities was directly related to the biodiversity of the plants and the animals that were here for millennia. So buffalo, sage grouse, uh, pronghorn antelope, moose, bighorn sheep, elk, deer, uh, bear, moose. Uh, all of the all of the animals were a big part of who we are as a people, and they would have been utilized at different times of the year. But buffalo was our sustenance; it was life's commissary. It was our food, our clothing, our shelter. When I talk to young people or kids, they say, "You know, where do you go when they need when you need stuff?" And they all yell out, "Walmart." <laughs> buffalo was uh, like our Walmart; it, it, it provided everything tools. Um, it would have taken 14 to 16 hides to make one lodge and uh, like a, a teepee. Uh, a lodge is uh, what allowed us to be a, a very, uh, I won't say nomadic because nomadic kind of implies that we don't know where we're going. We knew exactly where we were going, but we were very mobile and uh, that was because of the, the buffalo. Um, it's also central to our ceremonies and our customs, our spirituality. Uh, those were outlawed uh, up until only 42 years ago in 1978 with the American Indian Religious Freedom Act. And so they, they outlawed our, our belief system. They um, tried, you know, tried to stamp out our language. You know, colonization and assimilation was always the goal. But today in an era of self-determination, we can rekindle, we can refoster, we can relearn, we can reconnect. And the important thing is that we provide that foundation for our young people in no better way than, than with the buffalo, the bison. In our language, you say the, the uh, uh, Quitsu or Boijan. And there's other tribes that were very dependent on the bison as similar as we were really, Northern Arapaho, who we share our reservation with also were buffalo people. Many tribes in the Great Plains, this was the way that we, we survived. Well, the federal government, when they were coming west and gold and uh, manifest destiny and uh, these notions of free land uh, were, were prominent, then the, the, it became congressionally encouraged to eliminate the food source of native people. Uh, so they went from 30 to 60 million bison to less than 100 in 100 years. And so what happened to the Native Americans similarly happened to the bison, that we are now on remnants of our once former vast territories, bison on parks and refuges and private ranches, Native Americans on reservations. And so our future uh, of being able to exercise sovereignty, uh, self-determination. Uh, these are very important concepts that, that aren't generally taught in our American 
educational system. Even though we're 2% of the population, Native Americans have sovereignty, we have self-determination. That's because of a treaty. Uh, over 800 treaties were made with the federal government, 400 of them ratified by Congress. But every single treaty ever made was violated or broken in some way. Even though by the Webster's Dictionary, it, it's the supreme law of the land. So today in our, in our efforts in self-determination and growing a foundation of leaders uh, amongst our young people who are the predominant majority of our populations, we have to ensure that they have that foundational understanding. And Buffalo is not only about cultural revitalization, about relearning our songs, relearning our ceremonies, reincorporating Buffalo into our diet because it's so nutritionally important. It is the most nutritious meat. That it's also very important for ecological restoration. As a keystone species, it benefits many other organisms, benefits uh, birds and mammals, insects, even salamanders and, and reptiles in places. It's also very important because of their, their wallowing behavior, which is important for uh, seed dispersal and uh, wa water accumulation. Many cultural plants, which were foods and tools and medicines are directly associated with the wallows and their behavior. So there's a, there's a, <clears throat> a knowledge system that is intertwined with Buffalo and we've, we've forgotten their importance on the landscape as a keystone species. We've forgotten what they look like as wildlife on the landscape. Well, tribal lands and, and, and for example, here at Wind River, these are some of the best places that can really set precedent for what wild buffalo management looks like. It's where we can measure the effects of uh, change, not only to the landscape and in the plant and animal community, but also the change that we see in the healing of our young people from these atrocities of the past that we can now uh, address and heal from through cultural revitalization and educational efforts. So the uh, buffalo, very important to me. I, I uh, had an epiphany in East Africa with my dad and uh, we were in the middle of the wildebeest migration, uh, which is one and a half million wildebeest. We drove for over a hundred miles. And as far as you can see in every direction was wildebeest, including about 30 other species, including predators. What was unfathomable unfathomable to me at that moment was that that's less than 5% of what the bison was here less than 200 years ago. We had a Serengeti of our own and we destroyed it in order to subjugate Native American people. And today we have to uh, address those things. We have to address that history, but we have to do it in a way that's constructive uh, and in a way that is compassionate and, and uh, has empathy and love and caring for what we're trying to do because traditional ecological knowledge overlaps very well with our principles and understandings of environmental science and ecology. And if we can mend and meld those two through our conservation efforts, then we can, in essence, do uh, uh, the healing of the land along with the healing of, uh, of our people. And uh, no better way to do that than, than with bison. And so I'm you know, grateful for the National Wildlife Federation and, and its commitment to uh, recognize the, the past, but, but also the opportunities for what we can do now and, and in the future. And so i um, proud to be part of that work and, uh, and have colleagues like Garrett and Andrew who, who get it. And, um, and folks like yourselves who continue to uh, provide support that, that we need to do this work. So I'll, uh, I'll stop there for now. Thank, thank you, Jason. Uh, you know, um, always impressed by um, just your wisdom and, and the thoughtfulness of your answers and, and just, just who you are. I'm so grateful for that. Um, Garrett, I want to pivot over to you and um, kind of ask you a question, you know, you and I have talked a lot about this in our own private conversations, but um, what do you see kind of as the biggest challenges going on environmentally with the tribes you work with? 
Um, and, you know, what do you feel like environmental organizations, you wish more environmental organizations knew about how to better work with tribes? You know, what, some, what would be some of the things you wish they, they knew um, and did differently in terms of their approaches with tribes? So what are some of the bigger issues facing and what do you wish environmental organizations maybe would do a little differently in their work with tribes? Yeah, thanks for that question. And, I, you know, I'm sure Jason has some thoughts too. I mean, part of what Jason just outlined would happen with Buffalo is kind of the, <laughs> it's a story of everything to do with natural resources and tribes, no matter what issue you talk about. It's a history of uh, subjugation, of exclusion, of lack of equity, uh, lack of funding. And so a lot of what Jason and I and our other colleagues do when we, you know, and Andrew and folks down there in New Mexico, like Jeremy Romero, who you may, maybe you've met. I mean, a lot of what we're trying to do right now is just to bring, help support tribes to increase equity around their natural resource and conservation priorities. And that runs the gamut from just having a seat at, a seat at the table to talk about um, the environmental priorities that they have to making sure that when uh, U.S. Congress considers some legislation that might fund wildlife conservation that actually tribes are included in that legislation. And so a lot of times, you know, when we talk about like federal policy and natural resource conservation policy, we've called it the and tribes exercise. So if someone will introduce a bill in the, you know, U.S. Senate or U.S. House that talks about, hey, we want to save this species or we want to create this fund for, for wildlife. And so then we go in the back end and we have to go through every sentence and say da 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 states, local governments, and tribes. So there's a lot of history of that exclusion. And so a lot of it is is really working with, you know, our tribal partners to identify opportunities to increase their opportunities to have capacity and resources to do exactly the things like Jason was describing to protect buffalo, to protect antelope, to restore habitat for species. And part of what National Wildlife Federation, I guess I would say we're good at is that we spent a long time developing uh, these relationships with tribes. And so that's kind of the first fundamental thing is, is, is building those relationships and those partnerships. Um, before you get to, okay, let's do X together, you have to spend the time together. Um, so that's really important to us. And the other thing is, you know, because of that history of exclusion and lack of resources, a lot of what we do spend our time doing is just making sure there's a space for dialogue. There's opportunities for folks like you to interact with tribal communities. There's opportunities for the tribes themselves to speak to each other because they have, you know, all this work they're doing, but not all the resources they need to do it. And so just creating that space for dialogue. And then in third, it's opportunities like this. It's opportunities to engage with people across the country to talk about the history, talk about the culture, um, and just create more of a sense of awareness of what that history looks like. And like what, what Jason said is not only understanding the history, but the opportunities in the future to partly rectify that. So I don't know if that partially answers your question or, or not. <laughs> sure. Open it to both Jason and Garrett. I mean, one of the things you and I, and we, we've talked about is, um, you know, what do you wish, um, you know, the environmental groups would do a little bit differently in terms of how they approach tribes? What have been some of the problems you've seen historically with the way environmental groups approach tribes? And, you know, what do you, I guess, what do you wish environmental groups knew? And maybe a little bit, what, do, what would you advise tribes to know a little bit about working with environmental groups too? Well, Andrew, I think that, that environmental groups working with tribes is still fairly new. That um, in a lot of communities on reservations, and, and it's, the, it's, the, it's the same here, and that is that programs, entities, uh, funding, comes to reservations and it's and it's great and a couple years things go really well and then the funding runs out or something changes and those entities go away 
And that has happened over and over and over and over. Even sometimes there's been academic institutions and other entities that have come in to extract and steal um, things from the tribes. Uh, recently, Virginia Tech University excavated a dinosaur on the reservation without uh, approval of the tribes and then attempted to fly it out by helicopter. So that's a, a prime example of a lack of consultation with the tribal governments or the tribal historic preservation offices that work to preserve uh, our cultural and natural heritages. So that I would say moving forward, there's environmental organizations that are are beginning to see the 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 opportunity, the realization maybe of the lack of inclusion that today we have to do something different. And because tribes have sovereignty, because uh, we have a land land bases, it's very important to uh, develop that relationship that Garrett talked about. And that is uh, starting with a, a government relationship, going to their leadership, uh, their elected councils, their elected government officials, and setting up a meeting to have a listening session. Not to go in and say, this is, this is what you guys should do, but to say, we want to genuinely support, you know, and reconcile and, and respect the tribal governance and the tribal knowledge base and wisdom that goes with some of these conservation efforts. And so that is the, the first step in developing that relationship. There's also going to be oftentimes community leaders that are you know, doing, doing some of the work. Maybe it's at the tribal college, maybe it's a, a young person doing language revitalization, or maybe it's a high school group that is working on a, a wetland rehab project. Maybe it's working closely with the federal agency that has trust responsibility to that tribe or those tribes and see if there is a relationship there that can be fostered to say, uh, maybe here's how we can uh, create some uh, opportunities together, whether that be cultural sites or uh, forestry or looking at uh, food sovereignty or food restoration. There's a whole host of uh, issues that tribal communities are working through and trying to decolonize and culturally revitalize that, again, um, overlap with our conservation efforts. There's going to be more common ground there than, than not. And so using uh, the, that, that common thread, uh, taking a holistic approach to understanding the, the issue at hand will create more understanding. And uh, it really comes down to finding those people, whether they're leaders or whether they're community leaders, uh, to, to foster those relationships and find that common ground and, and build uh, some effort around some like-minded and uh, common issues. And, it, you know, I would just add, I mean, that's really well said. And it, <clears throat> I mean, Jason and I, and Andrew, I'm sure you get this question too, but a lot of times people come to us and they're like, oh, we don't know how to talk to tribes. We don't, we don't know how to figure out, like, how can we have a conversation? I'm like, we're all human here. Just have a dialogue, you know? You know, it's not anything, you know, it has to be like so formalized. Have a dialogue and you discover your shared values. I mean, and just to elucidate, like, you know, I can remember a time, probably, this has been probably a decade ago, but at a supervisor whose supervisor basically came to us and they said, can you call up the Navajo tribe and tell them stop emitting, you know, so much CO2 from their Navajo generating station? I'm like, I cannot call up the tribal government and tell them not to do something. <laughs> uh, <laughs> if you want to have a, create a, a conversation and, and build a relationship with them, maybe we can talk about other opportunities for economic, you know, economic development and conservation that would 
the alternatives. So we that just reinforces kind of the concept of, of going in with a open mindset and like finding out where the shared values are and focus on the relationship building. And I think as a congregation, you do that every week and every Sunday, right? It's about building that community. And that's a lot about what it's like about working with tribes is building that dialogue and those relationships. Um, you know, and Andrew, I think you mentioned this before everyone came on, but like you're, we were mentioning kind of like the kind of you know, damages that are happening right now. You mentioned the Caja del Rio. I mean, people going in, you know, like Jason Gates by the dinosaur, where people are chipping out petroglyphs and shooting them. And it, it's, it's incumbent upon us and those that care about those special places to figure out ways to stop that. And to do that, we need allies. Mm -hmm. So to answer your question about like, what can, you know, you know, that relationship between tribes and, you know, environmental organizations, you know, it's a, it's a two-way street and we have to recognize as National Wildlife Federation and others do too, that we have certain power influ and an in, uh, influence because of, you know, what we do. And so we need to share that power and influence with our partners so that they can achieve their, um, their priorities and goals. So I'm going to ask one more question before I open it up to the bigger group. Um, and this it, perfect dovetail into a question I wanted to ask here and Jason. Um, so you've got Bears Ears going on, and that's still going on. And now Oak Flat in Arizona. Um, and also, you know, you just mentioned the Caja del Rio, where obviously petroglyphs are being defaced and, and chipped away and stolen and shot at and other sacred sites and archaeological sites of a lot of the pueblos, of course, uh, around northern New Mexico kind of hold this area sacred. And, and even, you know, folks in the Navajo Nation, um, an area like the Caja del Rio. Um, and so I'm, I'm curious from you all, I mean, a lot of my work as a pastor has, has been how to kind of highlight some of those shared values, some of those, those the importance of sacredness and spirituality um, from different multiple perspectives and cultures. And so I'm curious as to, from you all's perspective on issues, say from Bears Ears to Oak Flat to the Caja del Rio, um, what would you, you know, what would you say to spiritual communities, faith communities, churches, um, in terms of what you can see their role being as, in, in helpful as, as allies in kind of um, working on supporting tribes and protecting those areas or sacred sites? Um, what, what, what would you advise to, um, you know, spiritual communities in terms of, of what they can do to be helpful um, around these type of issues, which are obviously, you know, hugely important. Um, places like Bears are important to tribes all over the nation, but certainly, of course, the you know the five, um, the interfaith or the intertribal council. Um, so, so kind of interested in your all's perspective of what you see the spiritual communities from different faiths and perspectives, um, their role being in terms of being able to help support tribes and protect what is sacred or spiritual um, from multiple perspectives. Well, uh, I think a, you know, I have a presentation that I, I use to um, help people understand a, a native perspective, what I kind of term as a, as a medicine wheel philosophies or ways of knowing. For, for us here in the Northern Plains, evidence exists all over the place of, of medicine wheels. Uh, they're, they're written in stone on the ground. They uh, are celestial. Their wheel is, is very symbolic in that it is a, a foundational uh, understanding amongst indigenous people that everything happens in circles. Everything happens in cycles. And this is a uh, star knowledge. It's, uh, it's, a, it's, the, it's a foundation for a belief system that is evidence in, in almost everything that we do as, as in our tribes, in our ceremonies, in our, our songs, in our way of knowing. It's, it's based on this medicine wheel. And it, it, is, all, it is all around us. Uh, if you throw a rock in the water, it's, it be, it's a circle. If you look at a tree rings, they're in circles. Birds build their nests in circles. If you look at the, the, the planets, they're, they're circles. Uh, this 
is the most abundant symbol in nature. These cycles that also happen in circles uh, happen every day. The sun comes up, goes across the sky, and and this this cycle of these daily cycles uh, turn into these seasonal cycles. Uh, they, they happen at the at the, the solstice. You know, they, they, we had ceremonies at our solstice because of the sacred time of the universe. We also live in a polarity-based system, uh, positive, negative, light, dark, good, bad, uh, predator, prey. There's, these, there's this balance in nature, and these are natural laws that the people understood very well. And it's in our uh, ceremonies like the sweat lodge. The sweat lodge is a purification lodge. Um, it's, it's said that that lodge is, is the womb of our mother. Um, there's a reason that we sit on the ground in that ceremony. There's reasons that we bring those rocks in uh, because they're seen, they're recognized as the oldest beings. They were here when the dinosaurs were here. They're going to be lo here long after we're gone. Water is seen as our first medicine. In all of our languages, we have terms like ba nanashunte, hinati nech, mini wachoni, sacred water of life. That water, when it's applied to those hot stones that are heated by fire, another sacred element, then when we are in that purification lodge and you apply that water, that's like the breath of God. That water is essential to all life. All the four-legged, all the winged ones, all the ones that crawl, swim above, below the ground. When we say all our relatives in those ceremonies, we're not referring only to our, our family. We're also referring to those relatives, the four-legged, the winged ones, the ones that swim, the ones that crawl. That understanding uh, is, is a foundation for uh, our way of knowing and that's that's in our languages that's why our languages are so important because it contains our world view of how we see the uh, the world also how we see our role as human beings uh, as caretakers and stewards for plants and animals and the ones that can't speak because in our way of of knowing the way of our teaching is that we're not superior to those things. We are merely a part of it. And that, that, that medicine wheel understanding that the cycles, the circles that happen is a holistic way of looking at the, the world. Today, we are very linear, very linear, uh, you know, beginning and end, left and right. Uh, and if we could take that linear thinking and turn it into a circle, then we're going to find a lot more relationality about where we belong as human beings here on this planet with one another. We're very divided, not only in this country, but we, we're very divided across the world by color, by economic status, uh, by creed or, or class. And a, an indigenous worldview is more about the, the whole, every component and its part uh, is, is important to everything. And that metaphysical understanding of our place in the cosmology and the, uh, uh, the cycles that, that we're all a part of is very important. And I think that, that indigenous knowledge uh, it could be very beneficial for helping people understand that uh, what our role is as human beings. We're, we're all here together and we have to uh, lead again with compassion and empathy and understanding. And that's going to create much more uh, harmony in, in, in the world than, than the other. Uh, I think, you know, it helps to have a, a spiritual uh, understanding of indigenous people. Um, and that's where we find that common ground again.
that creation uh, is 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 a huge part of indigeneity, indigenous people and spirituality, is our belief in the great mystery, and uh, our understanding about where we where we fit in that. Well, I, I almost don't want to say anything, but I guess I will. <laughs> but Jason, that was awesome. Um, I mean, it, I, I just I jotted down a couple things. Um, you know, spirituality and church is not a building. It's not a, you know, stone mason building or a brick building or what have you. It's everywhere. And so we have to recognize that. Um, and, you know, Andrew, to get to your question of like how do folks engage, it's opportunities like this where we get to have a dialogue with you and to be curious. Um, we're all so busy, um, particularly the younger generations, uh, that we don't take the time to step back and think about some of the things that Jason just said or to do some research or do some reading about those concepts. Um, so we need to be curious and, you know, Jason and I haven't talked about this a lot. There's a huge focus of our work with our tribal partners on just engaging tribal youth, the next generation of leaders that will influence every aspect of our lives, including conservation, but in our churches, in our government, what have you. Um, and so I would just say, as you're curious about this, engage younger generations too, um, because like, if we're, if we're busy, someone that's, you know, in their teens and twenties, they're even distracted than us. And so I'll just, that's all I'd add. Well, su super humbled, um, as always, just to sit at your all's feet. Um, really grateful. And, uh, just, just good for my soul to connect with you all again and hear these, hear these different answers and insights because it's, you know, it's one of those things when you go to a place like the Caja del Rio and you stand amongst those petroglyphs that were done in, you know, the 1300s, um, and just realizing the wisdom and uh, of the people and how they understood those cycles as you were talking about, Jason, and understood the way the sun would hit the rocks or the moon would hit the rocks and the way that they uh, understood their connection with creation. It's just really humbling to kind of have this conversation with you and then, you know, have a place like that in our background right here in Santa Fe um, to be able to kind of stand on those landscapes and kind of, you know, understand the importance of those places, not just for yourself, but for the, the many generations that preceded you and the many generations still to come. Um, Want to hand things over to folks in this group if you've got questions for Jason and Garrett and just or, or any other things you want to talk about. We've got about 15 minutes left and, uh, just want to hand things over. Den Dennis, I see you raising your hand. You yes, I just want to state the obvious that um, Jason is the most impressive person I've come across in years. <laughs> Holy cow. Uh, your intelligence, wisdom, perspective is, is as if you were 70 years old. And I don't think you are. Um, so Jason, how far away from uh, Powder River Basin is your Wind River Reservation. Uh, Dennis, uh, thank thanks for that. I I um, I've had some close calls, I guess, uh, tough learning experiences that I think have brought me closer to understanding some some things that I, I needed to to find for myself. But uh, that's that's. I'm unfortunate. Uh, Powder River Basin is uh, about three hours drive from here to the east. Uh, was part of the eastern portion of the reservation uh, back in 1863, but would probably be, you know, we, the Shoshones, we used to uh, compete quite a bit with the Lakota, the, the Great Sioux Nation, the Lakota, Dakota, Nakota. So that uh, Black Hills area and the Powder River Basin was uh, part of the traditional territory for for uh, those tribes, and so we we did uh, we did compete. They were uh, an enemy tribes for for us, but uh, 
I guess not so much so because I have I have sons from Pine Ridge that are also Lakota. So um, the the Powder River Basin is a tough issue. You know, the oil and gas development there is uh, pretty tough to see, and, and the coal extraction, yeah. the mentality of, of people there is definitely anti anti tribal, anti buffalo in, in some regards. Uh, so, yeah, tough, tough part of the state over there, Powder River country. Has the production of, of the strip mining coal uh, reduced over time? Uh, um, I came super close to being the controller of the Pegasus mobile operation in 1982. And I'm so glad I didn't go there, but um, has the production come off of its peak? Yes, uh, you know, Wyoming is a heavily coal extractive state. You know, much of the economy for the state is, is oil and coal extraction. But uh, at the Powder River Basin, because of the decline in the global demand for coal, uh, several of those companies in the Powder River Basin have filed for bankruptcy. So they're, they're and actually the, the, the economy there the people are moving out of Gillette and, and part of that landscape because of the lack of coal jobs. Awesome. And, you know, there's, there's great animosity in the state against that, that there's no jobs, but it's not, uh, that's not driven by the state that, you know, that's global demand is down for coal and we're moving towards renewable, more sustainable energies. And that's a, that's just a fact. And so, it's um, it's tough for Wyoming jobs. But it's better for the environment, and um, it's it's part of change. And part of that uh, cyclical understanding is that the only constant is change. And what? Native people have been some some of the best at adapting to change over millennia. We had to. Yeah. Uh, one last question, y'all, and uh, Andrew, you and. Garrett can close your ears if you want to, but Jason, <laughs> are there tribal organizations that we could contribute <laughs> uh, monetary, uh, well, give money to that are uh, would help what you're trying to do environmentally and otherwise more directly than funneling our contributions through the uh, National Wildlife Federation? Well, perhaps uh, there is tribal, tribally led nonprofit organizations that exist. Uh, they're starting to pop up all more and more because nonprofit organizations allow the flexibility to do some things in tribal government or tribal communities that the governments aren't able to accomplish. Okay. Um, in, in your neck of the woods, I can think of the Utah Dene Bakea, which is a, a coalition of tribes working to protect bears ears and, uh, and grand staircase. Um, I'm working to start a nonprofit here for our Buffalo Restoration and Education Center. Uh, that'll likely be called the Wind River Tribal Buffalo mm -hmm. Institute. And, you know, I think that uh, empowering some of these tribally led nonprofits in tribal communities is uh, a way that nonprofits, environmental organizations can um, support the self-determination of those tribes uh, because most of those entities have to be in existence by the support of tribal governments. And um, for instance, the Tribal Buffalo Institute will be uh, heavily supported by our tribal governments, but you know we're not pulling any financial resources from the governments for that entity to exist uh, because our our, our uh, financial and economic situation is strained enough as it is. Um, that being said, that that's very important. But National Wildlife Federation has been. Um, you know, the, the primary driver behind our tribal buffalo restoration effort. The Shoshone tribe wouldn't have buffalo 
uh, we wouldn't be progressing in the way that we are had it not been for the tribal partnerships program. And so, you know, I, I see NWF, even though I'm uh, an employee for NWF, I, I see that entity taking the right steps to ensure that uh, we're moving in the right direction with Buffalo restoration on tribal lands. And, and so I would encourage you to, to not only, you know, support those tribally led nonprofits, but National Wildlife Federation is doing uh, a, a great job at getting that money to the on the ground efforts uh, where we need it to, to grow, uh, whether it's fencing, whether it's a uh, wells, whether it's uh, uh, retiring grazing permits. Um, those those on the ground efforts are very important and, and they wouldn't be getting done without NWF. Thank you. Jason, get it over to Judy. Um, but part of the reason, um, you know, Judy, Judy asked me to highlight three different nonprofit organizations that I thought were doing awesome work that I actually felt like I would give money to and were making a difference. And of course, these two guys um, were part of that, Dennis. So, so that's how that's part of how they ended up on this conversation today, but also how the Mission and Social Justice Committee ended up helping them out because. You know, I mean, what Jason's saying is exactly right. And I, and I do think it, it takes a village. I think you need to have the tribally led uh, nonprofits. And we work a lot, you know, Garrett's worked a lot with UDB, which is, you know, what, what Jason mentioned. I'm working with Bears Ears, Tewa Women United, you know, obviously here uh, more locally, um, but also at the same time, some of the bigger national organizations that I think have been um, really good about building those relationships and have begun and done it slowly and for a long time, like the tribal partnership program. Um, I think I think it takes you know the big the big ones to have some of the capacity and the ability to do some, move some different things, and then some of the tribally led ones to, to, to do some different things. So I think there's there's a lot of opportunity for both. Um, but Judy, let me let me hand it. Uh, yes, first of all, I want to thank both of you for being here today. And whenever Andrew plans anything, we know we're going to be um, really. Uh, inspired and excited about the work that you're doing. So thank you. Um, I was interested in, as I looked at your website on your schoolyard habitat program and just had a couple quick questions about that. Is it, it's not just for BIA schools, it's for public schools too. And do we have any of those schoolyard habitats in Santa Fe? And the other question uh, going along with that is, how would you see the communities surrounding these schools supporting the idea of bringing these habitats to the schools? For Garrett or Jason, I don't, I don't know who's more familiar with the program. I can touch on the New Mexico part, Garrett, if you want to touch on yeah. that. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, so I would, so we have kind of the foundation of the tribal partnerships program at National Wildlife uh, Federation is in there's two foundations. One is everything that Jason's talking about, our work with tribes on Buffalo. Another one was the connection to youth, which the Buffalo aspect has, but also just kind of the connecting with whether it's uh, tribal schools, BIA schools, uh, reservation schools, public schools, uh, after school programs, et cetera. And so a lot of our history of building this, this tribal partnerships program and creating these partnerships was through the school systems, particularly in the Southwest. A lot of the work that we did was on Navajo, which obviously spans both your state and Arizona, but Southern Ute, uh, Ute Mountain Ute in Colorado, really the Four Corners region is where we've historically done a lot of work with tribes around schoolyard habitats, but other education issues. And typically it's the, pro the, the program had been a basically taking that schoolyard habitats program, which is a general NWF program and working with uh, individual tribes to adapt it, to include the kind of cultural and language uh, implications that the tribes wanted to include. Um, so there was a lot of work done in the Southwest. We don't have an active program going right now as far as tribal schoolyard habitats because we started recognizing that, um, and this is a great thing, that a lot of tribal entities we're starting to stand up more and more to run those kind of programs. And so why would NWF be, unless we can help figure out how to get more resources to that, why would we be standing out in front and doing mm -hmm. that? A lot of times that's the goal of everything we work on. It's like, how can we build the power so that, that we can then step back and stay out of the way? Um, but 
Andrew, I know you know more probably about like what's happening with, in Santa Fe and Albuquerque and that sort of thing. Yeah, I mean, some of the some of the work that's being done um, through the New Mexico Wildlife Federation, which is an affiliate of ours um, at the National Wildlife Federation, is kind of along some of those lines. And you know, we were doing a lot of work more particularly with Santa Ana and, and Santa Domingo. Um, also, obviously, working really closely with the Santa Fe Indian School. Um, you know, and kind of kept up some of those relationships as well. And then there's been some, been some turnover in both leadership and some of those different programs too. So, um, one of the, the, the things that in terms of Santa Fe, I mean, you know, part of a program that's related to this, as Jason was saying, this is kind of a smaller part of a, big, a bigger program around kind of creating habitat and getting children outdoors and, and kind of that idea of early childhood outdoors kind of work. Um, they just did a big partnership just for y'all's knowledge with the Santa Fe Children's Museum. Um, and they're going to be kind of expanding that and then also expanding that onto the south side of Santa Fe as well. Um, so, you know, kind of build, and obviously that'll impact tribal youth, especially those that are living, you know, and, and engaging more within the Santa Fe area. Um, but I also think um, there's, a, there's a lot of opportunity around this kind of same stuff with the Santa Fe Indian School. As Garrett was saying, I think a lot of the different programs, particularly here um, in New Mexico, have been really good at becoming self-sufficient and kind of leading the way. Um, and so that's where a lot of that work has gone. But um, you, you are seeing some of that that's still kind of out there. Um, and, and New Mexico Wildlife Federation has been, been leading a lot more of that. I think our work tends to be here in particular, and Jason and I talked a little bit about this, is just, just the opportunity and the challenge of um, you know, supporting some of the different youth programs within tribes, some of the you know, tribal youth councils, for example, and making sure that they have opportunities to get outdoors um, and to um, do that in a way that's that's helpful and um, is understanding what they want to get out of the experience too. So you know, I work a lot, for example, with uh, Santa Domingo's uh, Pueblo Youth Council, and you know, their uh, their ideas around, you know, hey, we want to do a fly fishing trip. Maybe we can also get up to Bears Ears. Um, and also visit Fort Lewis and kind of look at, you know, talking about careers and natural resources and college opportunities for tribal youth, which they have a big scholarship program up there at that university. So, you know, kind of talking about, okay, here's what, you know, some of the folks are interested in. And so how do we make it a really fun and interesting and attractive trip that honors kind of culture and also meets the youth where they are and, and helps them have the skills and, and opportunities and background to, to know what is out there in the world for them. And so that's kind of, you know, what we've found ourselves to be in the position is, um, is um, building these relationships over time with the different tribes. And then they'll come and say, hey, you know, we really want to do something this summer with our youth um, and try to, you know, lead a camping trip or a fly fishing trip or get out into this petroglyph site, would you be willing to, to you know, help provide transportation there. And we'll, you know, our elders will come along and talk about what this site may mean to our youth. And then we can go camping afterward, right? So I think, I think that's a lot of, you know, the cool thing that I get to do working with Garrett and Jason is just to talk about those different things and those opportunities and those relationships. Um, you know, the one thing I would say collectively, and, and I'm grateful for that conversation around donations is there, there's a lot of work to be done. There's no shortage of work to be done. There's no shortage of a need for resources. And there's no shortage of really good relationships to be built. Um, and so, you know, kind of what I've, what I've found is, is that there's um, just a huge need and, and, and if folks are willing to listen, as Jason was saying, and build real relationships, as Garrett was saying, um, then I think that there's just incredible opportunities to do some really cool dynamic transformative work, but it's, it takes that kind of authentic foundation. And then at the same time, it takes resources um, to meet just kind of the diff different needs. I mean, every one of the Pueblos I've worked with, certainly up and down that I-25 corridor, has just such huge opportunities and needs for particularly, say, around their youth. Are there other last questions? We've got about two more minutes and then I want to be mindful of everyone's time. Any other, any other last questions for folks? I have a, uh, this is Mary Ann. I have a quick question. I don't know if it's the answer is quick, but if we were to uh, want to advocate other than financial resources, is there one policy or one legislate piece of legislation right now that if we were going to call someone or write a letter, email, whatever, is there one thing this week that you would say that we should do? Uh, 
Uh, Andrew, how do we pick? <laughs> yeah, exactly. There's, there's at least 10 that came to my mind just in that short question. <laughs> Go ahead, Garrett and Jason. I'm interested in your I, answer. I mean, so you all know what's going on with, with the administration, Chris, and, you know, there's a lot of talk about infrastructure bill and other things that are going to be added to the infrastructure bill. So a lot of the work that NWF is doing, not only as an organization, but in partnerships with tribes, is around ensuring that tribes, as I mentioned earlier, have equitable, equitable access to resources for their wildlife conservation needs. So there's two pieces of legislation I would, I would mention. One is called the Recovering America's Wildlife Act. Um, that would provide $1.3 billion per year for wildlife conservation across the country, as well as almost $100 million for the nation's 574 tribes. This would be the first legislation in history to earmark such a, a large amount of money to actually be equitable to tribes for conservation efforts. And then another piece of legislation that all of us work on that's pretty much this, I'm gonna knock on wood and say my prayers, slam dunk kind of thing, but uh, there's something called the Tribal Wildlife Corridors Act and, and your Senator, Senator Ben Ray Lujan uh, has agreed to be the Senate uh, sponsor of that bill. It would be extremely important for New Mexico because it would provide resources for the Pueblos and even the state agencies around there to collaborate around wildlife migration corridors up and down the Rio Grande River. So that would be my, my two thoughts. I don't know if Andrew, you're thinking about anything else. No, I think that, that's a good one. I mean, if you all call Ben Ray's office and say, hey, you know, we want to encourage the Senator to continue to take the lead on tribal wildlife corridors. Um, I think those are welcome phone calls and it's good for him to hear from constituents that, you know, you, you want his leadership on that bill. Um, Tom Udall carried that bill before, just to give you all a, a heads up. Um, and then there's a bigger wildlife corridors bill, but that's, that's a, that's a specific provisions. Garrett and I, um, you know, I've, we've worked for years on that issue. Um, I helped write some of those provisions with Udall staff. And now, now I, obviously the idea is to help some of that get carried over to the, the next Senator. Um, but I think it'd be good for them to hear that, you know, local people care about that issue and want his leadership. Um, Oak Flat is another, you know, uh, Oak Flat's another issue that, um, you know, there's some, there's some legislation out there on protecting that area. It's a really sacred, important area that impacts tribes in both Arizona and New Mexico. Um, and I think that, you know, continuing to call your senators and your house members and saying, hey, you know, we want you to support protecting Oak Flat um, is a good idea. Bears Ears continues to be out there um, and, and continue to restore that national monument or even make it bigger which is some of what the Intertribal Coalition, um, there's conversations around that. Um, Jason, what about you? You, you got one or two pieces of legislation you'd wanna have folks advocate for? Yeah, definitely those that were mentioned. Uh, uh, the Indian Buffalo Management Act would be another one uh, sponsored by Don Young uh, that would allocate federal dollars to tribal bison restoration efforts as, a, as an effort in treaty responsibility, trust responsibility to the federal government. Uh, Buffalo by treaty uh, should be accessible by tribes. And there's language of the Bolt decision that uh, designated federal funding to the Northwest tribes in Salmon, the, the similar way that Indian Buffalo Management Act would uh, designate funding for Buffalo or bison restoration to tribes. So that would, uh, when it comes up, would be another important one uh, to be an advocate for. Yeah, and many of you all are on uh, the Earth Keepers email and listserv. Um, and if you're on, hit me up. Um, th this is exactly how I get the ideas of our take action every week. And some of the policy things that I try to encourage you all towards is, you know, I don't try to push policies that I don't think, one, have any, you know, have no chance ever of passing. But two, I try to push policies that I know will actually make a real difference for real communities, as you all know. And, and some of how those policies come to me and how Jen and I craft those for those emails is these kind of conversations that I'll have with Jason or Derek or other folks across the country or different organizations where I'm saying, you know, folks just need to know that, you know, it's broken and sometimes dysfunctional as Congress is, um, that there's still some really good ideas out there and those ideas should see the light of day and that those ideas will make a real difference and provide resources for communities that really need them. So. 
Um, that's what I try to do in a lot of those Earthkeepers emails um, and have highlighted some of these bills in there. And I'll continue to highlight some of these ones in the, in the coming weeks, um, just so you all can see those on paper and what they, what they really entail and, and what numbers to tell your senators or reps to support. So, thank yeah. you. And thank you, Garrett and Jason. This is wonderful. Really enjoyed this. This was a great, great class. And Andrew, thanks for putting this together and steering us through. Hey, I just want to say thanks for the opportunity. It was great to have this dialogue. And, you know, we'll continue to, you know, if you ever want to talk to Jason or I again individually or as a group, we're happy to do that. Or if we can funnel information through Andrew to you, we'll do that and keep you posted. We should be, Jason should be seeing some baby buffalo calves pretty ah. soon up there on Wind River. So we might have some cool photos to share. Great. Yep. Now that reminds me, I didn't get to show my, uh, my video of the buffalo. I'll send that in the email. There's a beautiful, and there's a baby buffalo in that one too. So. <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Andrew. Thank, thank you, you, Andrew. Andrew. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, sorry to pull you away from the horses, Jason. <laughs> uh, that's all right. All right, have a good one. All right, take care. See you.